OK, so I think uh, we will present some great and exciting content in the next hour, uh, but um, thank you all for joining this webinar. So I think, uh, Arvind, if I'm not mistaken, I think this will run for an hour. I think the content is around 45 minutes. I will leave some time at the end for uh, for Q&A. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I think your most of you are muted, I think, by default, but uh, please feel free to post any questions you may have uh, in the chat. I think, Arvind, they are able to post questions in the chat, I think, right? Uh, then I yeah, can get to the questions. Yeah, there is a section called Q&A. They can post it there. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and then also I have two uh, two breaks, two short breaks in between to um, pause for questions. So I will take questions, and uh, we will also have a Q and A section at the end. And um, no, Arvind, I believe you will you are recording this uh, team session, and uh, I will follow your lead to wherever you will um, you will share the share the recording. Sure, sure. We'll put it on our Devopedia YouTube channel. From there, you can pick it up. Okay, great. And I'll I'll skip the uh, introduction. I think uh, Arvind <laughs> presented all my uh, background. Uh, I'm Prakash Patil, uh, founder and CEO of AppModzi. And uh, we were also going to have a few more presenters, but unfortunately they're not able to make. Uh, so I'll skip uh, skip them, and I, I will cover their content uh, very briefly. So, um, so the agenda for the webinar is um, for the first 10-15 minutes. I will give a background on. Uh, local technologies and, um, and and how they have evolved. And um, next, we will give you an overview of what uh, QM Cloud is and how it leverages uh, no code or local technologies. And I'll give a brief demo uh, for uh, QM Cloud uh, with a few use cases, and then we'll uh, get to Q&A at the end. Uh, but the key learnings and takeaway from this webinar I'm hoping that you will get, uh, most of you already may know uh, no-code and low-code technologies, but uh, hopefully you'll get a better understanding if, if you haven't already. And then uh, how uh, this specific technology can be used in cloud infrastructure space um, uh, with, with the use of tools like uh, QM Cloud. So just to give you a background, I think if you're an IT, or if you are related to IT in some form or shape, I'm sure you have you know what backlogs are. And most of you also may have felt that business folks are always asking for more, and it is felt that they are stalled. Um, they are, they always complain that uh, IT is is the bottleneck. Backlogs are mountains, and business is stalled. This is a famous quote from uh, Mr. James Martin. This was made uh, in the 1980s in his book. Uh, he was an expert in the field of system design, software development methodology, and computer-aided software engineering. And he also stated that the number of programmers available per computer is shrinking so fast that most computers in the future would be uh, put to work, at least in part, without programmers. So this was said way back in the 1980s. Some of the ideas of simplifying application development caught up in the 80s and 90s. And uh, Mr. Martin was also instrumental in developing many of these technologies. Uh, starting with uh, technologies as um, a fourth generation, uh, they're called 4GL, they were developed from 1970s through the 1980s. And 4GLs were basically uh, non-procedural languages contrasted with the earlier generation being algorithmic or procedural languages. Uh, the term can also apply to an approach that looks for greater semantic uh, properties and implementation power. Uh, the 4GL app ecosystem opened up the development environment to a wider population. Other examples of simplifi simplification included uh, case like computer-assisted software engineering and early rapid application development tools. They were called RAD. The 21st century 4GL systems have emerged as low code environment or platforms uh, for addressing the problem of rapid application development in short period of times. At the time, back in 1980s and early 90s, most of these low code technologies faced many challenges, well, we think, and they lacked the fuel to grow. We think this was due to many factors, including over promising and under delivering and they lacked a mechanism or a way to adopt best practices 
and address security risks that a non-programmer could not understand in technical terms. And of course, everything changed uh, when the World Wide Web or the internet, uh, which revolutionized everything, and the focus was then on the web, a new way to deliver apps and content. So if you look back at the timeline, in the modern era, many things have revolutionized how we think of applications and how they are developed and delivered. Uh, for example, the cloud has revolutionized and enabled new consumption models. With the proliferation of smartphones and social media, the businesses now need to rely on speed to market or time to value. And with the recent advances in blockchain, uh, Web3, and more recently AI, things have changed drastically, where the focus is on newer ideas, and more specifically, the ease with which we all can make use of AI technologies these days. This was digitization and the new business models have emerged. Organizations now, as, as you all know, could no longer afford to live with the same business model or legacy systems to survive these days. So this has led to the need for businesses to do much more, and they are not able to rely on their IT to be the sole provider of value creation in the digitization journey. So, so what is low or no code in today's context? Low code term was coined by Forrester, which is a research firm in 2014, and it emphasizes on visual and declarative techniques as opposed to programming. So to understand the landscape of uh, no code or low code applications and what they do and who they serve, it helps to understand them in different categories. So Gartner, another research firm has created these list of categories for these kind of apps. So they range from, uh, the first one is called LCAP or low code app platforms that focus on custom app development by abstracting or minimizing coding requirements. Then we have uh, BPA and RPA. So business process automation or robotic process automation. They're similar in the sense that they both are geared towards automation, but BPS is more for business process and RPA is for a specific task. An example of RPA would be a chatbot where it's focused on a specific task and a BPA is a set of tasks that is completed using automation, for example, an employee onboarding process. Next is uh, called MDXP, multi-experience uh, development platforms. MDXP supports cross-platform development and building custom iOS or Android or web apps, uh, chatbots, voice apps, wearable, and these days, IoT apps. The next category is uh, called CADP, C-A-D-P, uh, citizen, uh, sorry, IPaaS, uh, which is an integration platform as a service, which, which you already know what, what, uh, what PaaS would be. And the next one is a CADP which is a citizen automation and development platform. So these are mostly geared towards business technologists who can develop digital solutions and are not a traditional software developer uh, in, in the traditional sense. So these categories, um, Gartner has created these categories um, to make it easy to understand the landscape of uh, the low code or no code technology related apps. So we think, uh, we have a lot going in favor of low code and no code technologies this time around, as opposed to in the 80s. And we will succeed, I think, and we'll grow exponentially. With digitization fueling the growth in what businesses are looking for, it has created a huge demand for increasing, um, uh, for the demand for value creators and looking beyond the traditional IT departments. A few research firms call this as edge developers or citizen developers, where the value is being created by folks who know how the business works, what data they have, and what users or end consumers are looking for, but are not traditional programmers. So these newer technologies, including cloud and AI, I think satisfies many of the need that were not met in the earlier era for fueling growth for no-code and low-code technologies. So let's look at uh, what are the different interfaces or methods. Um, obviously, if you're a programmer, you know uh, you know how you how you develop programs using 
uh, programming languages and IDEs and so on, but with low or no code interfaces. Now, there are some common interface methods or techniques in use. First, they're capable of connecting to data sources. For example, as simple as connecting to Excel or different databases, or on the other end, different systems such as Salesforce or ServiceNow, et cetera. Second, they have an interface with um, very similar to like a drawing canvas with shapes and connectors, and users are able to interact with the canvas with the drag and drop capabilities, flow charts, and in some cases, uh, like guided wizard, where um, the app walks the user through to creating, creating an app. And lastly, um, most of the apps would come with predefined data sets or templates or blueprints and actions. So a user doesn't have to create everything from scratch. So some of, look at the, some of the examples. So here's a very basic example of building a website. Uh, Webflow is just one of the apps. There, there are many in the market, but Webflow, which can be used to build a website without any programming skills. So it supports a canvas or shapes and images and various formatting and drag and drop capabilities to build a website. I'm sure many of you may have already used or know, know these kind of apps. Next, this is an example of uh, UiPath. I'm sure uh, most of you also may have heard about UiPath, but this is one of the popular low-code apps where you connect to various data sources and build a complete business process uh, to automate it. Here on the screen, it's a screenshot of a customer onboarding app where you're connecting to Salesforce and uh, creating a customer onboarding app. And uh, here you see uh, QuickBase, uh, that's being used to create a quality control management system with different flowchart like interface and connections to different uh, different data sources. And on the other end, uh, this is an example of MATLAB, a more complex use case where an app is used to define various inputs like algorithms and testing strategies uh, to fine tune accuracy and create uh, something called SVM, support vector machine algorithm based predictions. And lastly, um, uh, slightly coming to the DevOps or the CI/CD uh, phase, this is one of the apps called Kyber, uh, where, where you're able to build a fully automated CI/CD promotion and gating process using flowchart and canvas-like capabilities. So Kyber can connect to different uh, sources like GitHub, um, uh, um, source repositories, testing tools, deployment tools, and so on, but you can compose uh, your CI/CD promotion and gating process using Kyber. So with no programming skills, uh, you're able to create uh, these applications. Let's look at the market and, and trends. The market is currently, uh, as per some of the research estimates, estimate from the research companies, the market size is around uh, $100 billion. It will it, be $100 billion by 2028. I believe it is currently at $30 billion. As per the predictions, uh, we will have 500 million apps in five years, right? So that's more than all the apps we have built in the past, uh, let's say 30 to 40 years. And also there are, new, there are two new trends as per uh, research firm called Gartner. The first one is hyper automation and something called composable enterprise. This will lead uh, the growth uh, we think in the low code and no code technologies. And again, when, oh. when these numbers were given, AI was not yet accounted for in the search, but I can easily assume that this will drive the projected market share even more. So I think somebody's microphone uh, was unmuted. If you can go on mute, please. So uh, hyper automation is a business driven disciplined approach that many organizations use to rapidly identify, vet and automate as many business and IT processes as possible. So hyper automation involves the orchestrated use of multiple technologies and tools. And composable enterprise is where a business is using technology to compose and recompose modular components to create adaptive custom applications for the changing business needs. And in terms of leading vendors, it's not a surprise that we see many traditional vendors like Microsoft, Salesforce, and Google who are major players in this space. Uh, for example, with Microsoft with the Power Platform at the forefront and many other apps such as Dynamics 
and Salesforce with their application platform. But you'll also see that there are many new faces, including Mendix, Appian, QuickBase, who play into different categories uh, that we talked about in the application, in the low-code application space. So to summarize, we saw how low-code has come into being uh, from the 80s and 90s and has seen the emergence of low-code. And we see the modern era where cloud, digital, AI, ML, and the need for value creators has increased uh, beyond uh, the traditional IT departments because of various reasons, including skill shortage. And we will also see major vendors in this space uh, that will, and, and the list of major vendors will keep growing. And as, uh, as the research firm pointed out, uh, this market is slated to, re to reach $100 billion by um, uh, 2028. Sorry, that's a typo on the slide. It's not 2008, it's 2028. And 500 million more apps will be built. So this was the first section uh, where uh, we provided a summary. Let me take, take a, a small break and see if you have any questions. I think I don't see any questions in the Q&A section. And um, Arvind, if I'm not mistaken, people are able to unmute to ask questions, right? Yeah, they can do that, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so if there are no questions, then I will continue to the- Hi, Prakash, I'm Rajesh. Yeah, hello, Rajesh, go ahead. Honestly, I'm working as a- uh, so I want, how can I uh, transition? Oh, no, oh. I want to move uh, to this. Sorry, Rajesh, I cannot hear you. You're breaking up a bit. Um, can can you please repeat the question or or, or you could post the question on Q&A? Uh, I'm interested in uh, no code, no code. So how to start? Okay, so it seems like your question is you're interested in low code, no code. You're asking how to start? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, yeah. If you can hold that question, uh, hold that question towards the end. I, I, I have a, uh, I have an answer for that. But if you can, if you don't mind, please hold that question until the end. I, I will come and address address that question. Uh, what about uh, this traditional CMS systems like WordPress and uh, Joomla? Would you consider that as no code and uh, low code platforms? Yes, yeah, that's an excellent question. Yeah, I think there's there are some gray areas of uh, what what applications are no code and low code. Yeah, well, I would consider them uh, low code, uh, and and maybe also in in the traditional sense no code. Uh, I think I I don't have the link as we speak now, uh, but Arvind, I will share the link of Gartner's uh, research paper that has classified most of the apps into the six buckets. Uh, that I talked about, but yeah, and in um, in short summary, I think yeah, I would consider them low code. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's uh, let's move to the next next section. So I'll give a, I will switch gears and uh, this your overview of QM Cloud. <clears throat> so let's look at uh, what we do today to deploy cloud infrastructure. So I think if, if you have already uh, you know, used cloud, either AWS, Azure, Google, Alibaba, or um, I think there's another one, um, I forget the name, which is like a private cloud infrastructure, I think. Uh, but, th but there are three main methods uh, to interact with the, with the cloud today, right? So the first one is a traditional console where it's a user interface where you log into the providers uh, app uh, using a web browser, um, uh, and then uh, there are predefined uh, services or components that are exposed to you, and then you use either a wizard or a default action. So the first is a console. Um, the um, I'll talk about a few more things, but the provider's console is very a manual way of doing things, especially with infrastructure as autom infrastructure as code and automation. Uh, being the best practice. The console is not the, if you deploy the infrastructure using console, it's not scalable and it's not easily repeatable. If you want to deploy the same infrastructure, let's say in a dev or a test or a prod, you'd have to repeat the whole thing again, right? And the second one is, uh, which which is which is the dominant way of doing things today with cloud infrastructure, 
is a domain using a domain specific language. All right, so this is a uh, cloud providers native configuration language. The more important point here I want to point out is they're all proprietary languages. They all have emanated from like relying on configuration files, right? And these are proprietary and they require special skills of programming constructs. So if you have heard about cloud formation, Azure Resource Manager and, and uh, um, uh, Google commands, right? So these are all proprietary languages and require special skills. And they are not similar to traditional programming languages. And the third way is uh, to use a third party tool. And obviously there are lots of tools in the market, uh, but Chef, Puppet, Jenkins, Ansible. So these are some of the uh, well-known well -known tools in the market. Uh, for deploying cloud infrastructure. They, were, they are mainly for cloud infrastructure configuration, but they also have uh, infrastructure deployment capabilities using add-ons or modules. So in, in summary, uh, the modern cloud infrastructure deployment is complex and time consuming. So either you use console, which is very manual, cannot be, is not scalable, cannot, cannot, is not repeatable, or you have to know the domain specific languages, which is very complex. Uh, on top of the cloud infrastructure skills, you also have to learn learn that language. So that's very uh, time consuming. <clears throat> um, so uh, as as I think we introduced in the beginning, um, cloud infrastructure deployment is made easy using using the no code or low code tool like QM Cloud. So with QM Cloud, you can deploy cloud infrastructure with no programming experience. It offers various local technologies such as Canvas, drag and drop, and the guided wizard that we talked about. And it generates code automatically on demand behind the scenes. And cloud architects um, can define the desired posture in the cloud with all the guardrails of security and ports open and closed and so on. And then they can deploy the cloud infrastructure very easily. And it provides uh, various APIs um, so even though you use the user interface uh, for QM Cloud, it provides a traditional API so you can interoperate with other tools that you may be using uh, for CI and CD uh, use cases. And also uh, the main use case for QM Cloud is you as a cloud architect uh, or a security architect for cloud, you can create infrastructure templates based on best practices and then application deployment teams can reuse them. Uh, so you're enabling self-service um, uses for deploying cloud infrastructure. And you are the ones who are, uh, who are saying these are the best practices and these are all the security and compliance guardrails uh, that this cloud infrastructure should, um, should have. And, and the beauty of, of uh, QM Cloud in this case, as it, it provides a consistent experience ac across multiple cloud providers. So, Irrespective of uh, AWS, Azure, or Google, uh, you have a single console, single UI, single way of low code interfaces and methods to deploy infrastructure. Uh, so you, you don't have to learn different um, domain specific languages to be able to deploy to a different, uh, different cloud. So we'll, um, so I'll, I'll change my uh, screen sharing and I will show you let let me share my screen. Let me know when you can uh, see my screen, the screen, I think. So, uh, can, yeah, can, yeah. I, I yeah. can see that you have cloud uh, page. Okay. Okay, great. Yep. Okay. So, um, so I've, I've just logged into QM Cloud, and this is this is how the interface looks like. There are lots of things here, but I will let me just focus on on a few things here. Um, so, I'll first get to the main um, to the main um, um, main component in Stacks. Uh, stack in QM Cloud is nothing but a unit of infrastructure. So, for example, if you're deploying a virtual network, um, it's a stack. If you're deploying an like, entire landing zone, uh, which is virtual networks, subnet, storage account, 
um, uh, EC2 instances for security and compliance and so on. So that's the entire spectrum of services uh, that's called a landing zone. So stack is nothing but a unit of infrastructure, but let me just show you quickly a simple use case. So when I go to add a stack here, so there are different methods to add a stack, uh, canvas-based stack where you can compose your infrastructure from scratch. Uh, there's something called import stack definition. Uh, if you have a, a stack already pre-created, uh, you might have a JSON file with the definition of stack, you can import using that. And the third one is a wizard based. It's a guided wizard, which uh, QM Cloud will ask you, hey, what do you want to do? And you can define saying, okay, I want one VPC with uh, five subnets, uh, private and public. You can define the IP address block and so on. So it walks you through and it automatically creates the infrastructure for you. And the last one is scan and import, import a stack. If you have already deployed some cloud infrastructure in let's say AWS or Azure, um, QM Cloud has the capability to scanning that infrastructure uh, and importing that and visualizing uh, that on a canvas. So this is very powerful uh, functionality that we have. So let me show you a simple, uh, let me go with the uh, canvas first. You guys are still able to hear me, right? I saw some, I, I heard some beep. I was not sure. You, you guys can still hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay, sorry, yeah. Okay, so I'm here, I'm creating a stack. I given a name, uh, workspace is nothing but a logical grouping of uh, different stacks. I can create multiple stacks, one for let's say network, one for let's say storage, one for compute. And I'm able to uh, provide output uh, of one stack as input to another stack by use of workspaces. And uh, here, as you saw, as of now, we support AWS, Azure and Kubernetes. So you'll see the three platforms. Uh, for some enterprise customers, we also support uh, VMware or vSphere, uh, but that's not shown on the SaaS platform that we have here. So let me go ahead and select AWS, and I'll come to the templates uh, in a minute, um, and I will choose a stack profile. So stack profile is nothing but the credentials. So this is the access key and the secret key and the AWS region uh, where I want to deploy the cloud infrastructure. And we also have an option of uh, the code that gets generated by QM Cloud, you can commit to a GitHub repository. So you can specify the GitHub repository URL uh, if you want to uh, manage or maintain the code for, from there. And now let me go ahead and say stay, uh, save. So the stack, uh, so the basic stack has gotten created now. Let me click on Canvas. So this is where, uh, this is the drawing board interface that I was talking about. So as you will see that this is um, uh, this is a uh, empty drawing board like Canvas. There's nothing on the Canvas as we, as we speak now. So here on the left side in the middle, you will see a list of all the services that AWS has exposed through their SDKs or CDKs. All right, so QM Cloud uh, supports all services that are, that are available in AWS. So these are the different categories, but let me go ahead and choose, let's say VPC, which is nothing but a virtual private cloud. So I select VPC here and drag and drop onto the canvas. So, so basically I have now, um, uh, on the canvas, I'm now composing my cloud infrastructure. So I've dragged and dropped VPC and I highlight the VPC component or resource here. And now I can define some basic properties. Let me go ahead and define some basic properties here. So uh, the first one, this is a required property for VPC. Uh, this is the CIDR, the IP address block. I specified that and let me go ahead and um, uh, provide a name called uh, VPC demo and click on submit. Um, so now I have defined the properties of this cloud infrastructure. So now to uh, to deploy this infrastructure, I just go through four uh, unique steps like sh save, validate, plan, and apply. If if you use um, Terraform or CloudFormation, you may know some of these uh, concepts. Um, so when I save and validate, uh, QM Cloud is looking at all the definitions behind the scenes, and it is making sure that all the properties are provided uh, by the user. And when I create on plan, uh, behind the scenes, uh, QM Cloud is now creating an execution plan. It's not deploying this yet, but it's creating an execution plan and making sure all the dependencies are, are proper. Um, it, it should take uh, 10, 15 seconds uh, for planning. And once that is done, I can, I can click on apply. Uh, apply is 
applies where the infrastructure gets deployed. So let me go ahead and click on uh, click on apply. So this will probably take uh, 10, 15 seconds again. Uh, but in the meantime, when, when this applies in progress, let me show you um, something else. <clears throat> So now I'm switching uh, switching my browser to a different instance of QM Cloud that we have. Um, so here I've already created a few infrastructures. So for example, let me go let me go to this AWS LZ1. I've created a simple EC2 uh, compute instance uh, where you can see that uh, this has already been deployed. So you'll see that this I've already gone through the motions of save, validate, plan, and apply. And this is an EC2 instance. This is an Ubuntu um, EC2 instance that's already been deployed to uh, AWS. Let me show you a few things here where the, all the magic happens. So if I go to stack details, uh, the first thing is it'll tell me the details of uh, the instance that was deployed in AWS. So if I click on um, the instance here, it'll show me all the properties, all the uh, associated properties of that, the, of that instance uh, from here. Uh, it'll tell me what instance type it is. Um, it'll tell me the IP address of that instance. Uh, the public IP address and so on and so forth. So you'll see the same thing that you see on a console for AWS um, for an EC2 instance. You see all the details here. Uh, the other thing is, uh, this is the actual code that got generated by QM Cloud automatically. So as of now, we generate the code in JavaScript. Uh, so you will see the .js file here. Um, so QM Cloud dynamically generating that code when you when you hit validate and apply. And then you also see a config file uh, where all the configuration, um, uh, all the configuration and properties of that component are stored. So these two, the configuration file and the actual JavaScript um, uh, program file, can be committed to GitHub repository so you can track and audit, um, uh, audit and manage the deployments that way. This is very powerful, uh, right? So me as an end user, without having to write a single line of code. Uh, I've deployed cloud infrastructure. I have a visualization of the cloud infrastructure. I can see what I've deployed. And more importantly, I have generated code in a traditional programming language, uh, which in this case is JavaScript. So this is not a domain specific or proprietary language. It's a JavaScript, um, uh, JavaScript configuration file that I've created. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you as a cloud architect or a security architect or a network architect, you can compose this infrastructure and you can create a template and you can say that I'm going to share this template with my application team. So for example, let's say I'm creating a Java app. Uh, I'm an application developer. I want to deploy a Java application, um, but I, I need some infrastructure to deploy the Java app, right? Either it, it would be IAS, EAS, or it could be PaaS, uh, but I can access this template uh, using an API uh, through my deployment. For example, let's say I'm using Jenkins uh, to do the deployment. So I can access the QM Cloud API to deploy the infrastructure first. And then once that is done, I can proceed with deploying uh, my Java application. So me as an application developer, I did not have to do any programming for the cloud infrastructure. And I just happened to use uh, the API and which a template was created for me and, and given to me. Uh, the last uh, the last piece here on this screen is this is very powerful. So uh, before you deploy the infrastructure, you can estimate the price cost of how much it's going to cost me to deploy this infrastructure. Especially these days, um, the cloud costs are unmanageable unless you have a very good process and a process in place uh, to manage your cost uh, that the, that you spend on cloud. But this functionality provides you an option to get the price of an infrastructure even before deploying it so you can manage the cost. So in this case, for example, I clicked on get price. Uh, behind the scenes, it is connecting to a pricing API that we have developed and it will tell you uh, the approximate price. So for example, let me, it gives you the mid uh, minimum, maximum and a mid range. So if I look at the maximum pricing, uh, so this is in US dollars and it's going to cost you per month $63. So it's telling you, the daily cost, hourly cost, and a monthly cost uh, for this infrastructure. Obviously, if you had much more uh, on this stack, like different instances, different storage accounts, it would have given the price for all the components um, in in this uh, stack. So as you as you see, um, as you saw, it has the deployment capabilities, interoperability capabilities with uh, CI/CD tools using API, uh, and then it generates the code which you can audit. 
if if you if you're if you have a need to audit and manage the code in a GitHub repository, and then you can estimate the price of your cloud infrastructure. So this is very powerful. So as you saw, without having to write a single line of code, I was able to do all this uh, uh, for the cloud. <clears throat> and the same thing, for, same thing can be done for Azure or Google. And and if you already have a Kubernetes cluster, you can deploy. Um, Kubernetes-based applications using QM Cloud from there. So, for example, the next one I'll, I'll just show the uh, this one I had. So, sorry, coming back to the VPC that I was doing the deployment. If I go back to the canvas, uh, as you see, the VPC was already deployed, and uh, here at the bottom you can also see the logs, and it'll tell you that um, how many resources was created, how much time time it took for uh, for creation of that. And uh, similar to the stack details, I can come here and look at the uh, properties for the VPC, different properties, and then you can see the code that was deployed, uh, de um, generated behind the scenes uh, for the VPC. Now, this was a very simple use case, which I said, uh, let's take a simple virtual private cloud and show you. But now let me show you uh, this. I've already done the deployment, the actual deployment for an elastic Kubernetes service in AWS. So this is a pass a Kubernetes service for which AWS provides. It's called EKS. And I had composed this for another client, but we created a template. So as you see in this template, there are different uh, groups. On the top, you see a VPC, which is a virtual private cloud. So it is, it has two subnets, uh, one private and one public. And on the left side at the bottom, you'll see that you have routing. Uh, when you deploy a virtual private cloud, you also need uh, routing uh, for all the traffic, in, ingress and egress traffic, uh, right? So you have internet gateway, you have a route table, you have a route. Uh, so all that was defined using the canvas. And on the right side, you will see uh, IAM, identity and access management roles. Uh, so a few roles and role policies were created. So only the required user and the AWS account can interact with this EKS cluster. So those were defined. And then in the middle, you'll see that the EKS cluster. So this is the elastic Kubernetes cluster, the control plane, uh, which has cluster and it has different add-on for CNI and the uh, Kube proxy service uh, that was deployed. And at the bottom, you'll see that uh, we have the node proxy, which is, uh, sorry, the node group, which is the actual cluster node uh, where applications get deployed. So this, so this is a real use case where customers are, um, Let's say for, for one of our financial services customer is using this uh, QM Cloud tool to create templates and uh, provide APIs to their application team so they can deploy applications. And the QM Cloud API automatically deploys the Kubernetes cluster behind the scenes. Um, <clears throat> so I think in this case, you will see that I've used um, different multiple shapes, uh, but I use connections, uh, connectors to define the dependencies for. Uh, for connections. So let me go back to the VPC that I had deployed and let me show you a simple use case for uh, how I can define dependencies and how I can connect different different subjects. So in this case, I've deployed a uh, virtual private cloud. Now, obviously with the with the, just a VPC, I cannot do anything in AWS. So let's say I, and now I've had dragged and dropped a subnet where I can define, uh, where I can deploy EC2 instances, for example. Um, so I've uh, let me take this copy this uh, property and then come to this subnet here and define uh, the subnet's IP address block and let's say subnet one. So here I click on submit. Uh, so it's not it's not just enough to drag and drop the subnet component here. QM Cloud needs to know how this subnet is associated with this VPC, right? So one way is to connect. Um, Using, uh, using the local technologies, I can drag and drop an arrow to define the dependency. So by doing this, what I'm doing is I'm defining the input property called VPC ID of a subnet and connecting that to VPC object. So what QM Cloud will do is it will pass the VPC ID property uh, via this connector to the subnet component as an input and, and do the deployment. But if I have a complex infrastructure, you can imagine that there'll be a lot of connections, all right? Like the one you saw in EKS cluster, you'll have to drag and drop lots of connections. You have to know which connector goes where, right? You have to know that. But what QM Cloud, uh, another example of QM Cloud, what it can do is it has something called auto connections. So if I click on connections here, QM Cloud knows many of the connections uh, that, that can be automatically made. 
so the it doesn't um, uh, the uh, the user doesn't need to make the connections automatically so uh, manually so if i go to auto connections here it will show by default all the possible connections that qm cloud knows and you can check this and you can say connect and it will automatically make the connection so this is very powerful by just dragging and dropping components and defining properties was one aspect but to define the dependencies uh, without any program interface by using connectors and having the capability of uh, connections database uh, where QM Cloud knows uh, what component will connect to what other component using what property is very powerful. So I showed a simple example of VPC and subnet, uh, but the EKS, uh, but the EKS cluster that you saw earlier, that example, you saw how many connections were there, right? From IAM to uh, VPC, from VPC to routing, routing to EKS and so on. So those were all made by auto connection. So the user doesn't, an architect who is composing this infrastructure doesn't need to know uh, that level of details. So I think I've shown most of the, um, most of the capabilities here. Just one last example I wanted to show was um, something called a template. So let me, um, I'll just show the same EKS example. And let me show, let me select the platform for AWS. Now here uh, in this template, so this is a predefined template. So let me go ahead and choose the EKS template. And let me just choose US West one as my AWS uh, profile for credentials and click on save. So now instead of having to deploy, uh, having to compose from scratch, when I use a template and when I use open the canvas, you will see that the whatever components and connections were defined in the template, they're already visible for me. So this, uh, either you want to make some small changes or you want to deploy the same infrastructure to a different region, uh, you can use templates and you can modify the properties um, and, and then do the deployment. So this will simplify uh, simplify the deployment uh, deployment for you. So I think this, this showed um, most of the features of uh, QM Cloud. Uh, uh, it also has additional capabilities for multi-user, uh, multi-organization, multi, um, uh, uh, multiple roles uh, for a robust uh, role-based access control. So if you have an organization with multiple business units, multiple users, you want to limit what, um, what users can do uh, with the infrastructure using QM Cloud, you can define those advanced capabilities. And uh, we, we have two, uh, two methods of using QM Cloud. One is a SaaS, a SaaS version, which you can go to app.qmcloud.io and sign up uh, for a developer edition, which is free. And then you also have an advanced edition where, you, where it supports multi, multiple users with role-based access control. And the other one is if you, if you are an enterprise with uh, uh, and are security sensitive, uh, you can also deploy QM Cloud in your data center. And we will, we will provide the Docker containers that, um, that you can deploy in your data center. So you can use it for private, uh, private use and not, not as a SaaS, um, uh, as, as a, um, a multi-tenant SaaS, uh, SaaS system. So I think I showed most of, the, um, most of the capabilities. So let me go back to the slides now. I'll stop sharing here. <clears throat> Okay, so now I think you should see the other uh, PowerPoint slide. So I think I'll I'll take another brief um, uh, brief pause here and see if you have any any questions. Yeah, it was a very interesting and useful demo. Not not seen anything like it. Uh, so one thing I wonder is why are uh, the traditional cloud providers not providing a tool like this? Definitely, this kind of a thought or idea would have occurred to them. Either AWS or Azure. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, um, yeah, th 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 that's a great point. Yeah, I think they have tried, and again, it's it's not that it's it's not possible for them, right? They have a lot of money, they have a lot of people, uh, they have all the, but I think they probably don't have the focus. Uh, I think the way they started, right? They, uh, the basic tenant of cloud at that time was, I mean, even today is like scale, uh, right? Mm -hmm. And they wanted uh, programmers. Uh, to do things repeatedly and so on. So when when AWS was launched, uh, the low code and no code ecosystem was very uh, very low profile. Uh, but they have tried. Uh, it's not that they have not tried. I think AWS has some low code um, uh, similar to a cloud formation. They have something called cloud formation designer, uh, which mm. you can use. But it it is nowhere close to what I just showed you. Uh, you can drag and drop, make connections, but 
in the end, it doesn't do the deployment by itself. It creates cloud formation scripts, right? You have to know what to do with the cloud formation script. You have to modify some of the properties. You have to define the dependencies and so on. So, so I think I, I I don't know why they have not done it, but they have tried. Uh, but yeah. I don't think it is it is for the lack of money or lack of people. I think it's just the focus, right? Sometimes big vendors, uh, their focus is different, um, right? So, um, so so I would say that. Yeah. So it is like uh, I mean it's not um, it's more than what uh, Terraform offers because there I think you need the domain specific language. And yes. Then, yeah. Uh, and uh, there is uh, another platform, Pulumi. You might have heard of that as well. Yes. But yeah. There yeah, also yeah, I think you have to write a lot of code. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Pulumi. Yeah. Actually, we use some of the some of the backend engine of Pulumi. But yeah, they are Pulumi and Terraform. They are both. Uh, so, so they're both traditional uh, uh, traditional programming languages. So I like the I was in fact going to ask you about the pricing price calculator. So it's good that you showed that. So that's something that's very useful before we actually deploy. Yes, yeah, yeah. Did you um, yeah, did you have any question Arvind, on that or you were just curious? Yeah. No, no. Uh, in the earlier part of your uh, demo, I was asked, thought of asking about the price calculator. Then later on, you showed it. Oh, okay. So that <laughs> yeah. Is, uh, yeah, very useful feature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, last question is, uh, see, uh, you showed uh, some examples of uh, pipelines. Suppose one part of my pipeline, because there are some uh, poly clouds and multi cloud deployments. Let's say one part of my pipeline is on uh, Azure, the rest of it is on AWS. Is that something you support right now? Uh, sorry, Arvind. So, so you're saying the you're saying you have infrastructure across AWS and Azure, and you want to deploy yeah, as yeah, a unit. Yeah, a unit is yeah. that what you mean? Yes, yes. Yeah, no, we don't. Yeah, as of now, that, that's a great question, and some of the customers have uh, have uh, asked that question. As of now, uh, you can do that. So, I guess the answer is partially yes. Uh, you can create one workspace uh, for, let's say, you have an application where some infrastructure is in Azure and some in AWS. You can create one workspace, but you still have to create two different uh, stacks, yeah. one for AWS and one for Azure. Uh, but, but, but that's a great question. Yeah, some of the customers have asked, and I think we have that in the backlog. I don't have an ETA for that feature, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think. Um, uh, we are thinking, I think as of now, if I'm not mistaken, we're targeting for Q1 of uh, 24 uh, for that feature. But yeah, that's that's a great question. So currently you take an output from one stack and connect to another stack, something like that? Yes, yeah, yeah. So for example, I think uh, one of the use case that a customer had for AWS and Azure is uh, they wanted all their infrastructure in AWS uh, but they want to use uh, the networking, most of the networking capabilities of Azure. Azure has something called traffic ma Azure Traffic Manager. It's called ATM, uh, which you can use. You do some interesting things with DNS. You can say failover from one region to another region, um, um, connect to users in India for an India uh, front end and so on. So they wanted to use ATM, Azure Traffic Manager, and but all their application is in AWS. Uh, that was the use case. So as of now, they have deployed two stacks, one stack for AWS with uh, with their web servers and CloudFront and caching and so on, and another stack for Azure Traffic Manager. The What they are doing is uh, they are passing the CloudFront URL uh, to the Azure Traffic Manager uh, DNS load balancer uh, through, the, uh, uh, through the user workspace. So as of now, so I would say it's a bit manual uh, in that sense, but it would be it would be great if I'm able to compose uh, ATM and the AWS infrastructure on a single canvas. But yeah, yeah. The, so the answer is we don't have that as we speak. But you can manage it using a workspace and multiple stacks. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any any other uh, questions in the Q and A, and I think. Uh, I mean, I think we're probably running a bit late. I think we are, we are six more minutes, I think, uh, left. Yeah, go so ahead. You can continue with the slides. Yeah, yeah I think, yeah, the slides are over. I think I'll just, um, I think, wrap. I'll try to wrap up and uh, maybe leave um, a few more minutes at the end. 
Um, yeah, so I think <clears throat> that was just just very quickly in QM Cloud, we have a big roadmap, but uh, some of the uh, some of the things that we are um, uh, in terms of features is scan and import. Uh, we already have that in beta with some customers, but it will be released next quarter. Uh, drift, de drift detection. So, for example, if you already deployed cloud infrastructure, uh, one of the features that the customer wants to know is if somebody made a change outside of QM Cloud, uh, how do I know, uh, right? So you can detect the drift, um, a drift using that. Uh, the third one is security and cost policy. So I showed you how to estimate the cost, but uh, we are providing a no code mechanism to define security and cost policy. So for example, you can say, hey, uh, don't allow uh, these users to deploy anything which is more than let's say $1,000, uh, right? So you can define that as a policy. So in that way, uh, the users will not be able to, uh, will not be able to uh, deploy anything uh, using a stack. They can define, they can compose and uh, and try to deploy, but uh, QM Cloud will block uh, uh, will, will will block the deployments uh, for that. Um, and we are also soon going to um, release something called application templates. So as of now, our focus is on infrastructure, uh, but we are slowly making progress towards supporting application deployment using low code. But we will start with uh, supporting application templates. And the last one, last but not least, which I was hoping. Uh, that uh, one of our um, advanced uh, senior DevOps engineer would uh, show is the AI capability of uh, prompts and rendering visualization. So as opposed to composing on a canvas, uh, you can actually chat uh, chat with the QM Cloud AI module and you can say, hey, uh, you can compose the infrastructure using prompts. And you can say, hey, compose, add a VPC, add a subnet, connect VPC and subnet, and you can render visualization. Uh, right, so it's already possible to use AI to generate code, uh, but the, the capability that we are adding is to render visualization and creating that visualization in the canvas uh, using AI technology. So these are some amazing uh, features that we'll be releasing uh, very soon. Um, so I think at the end, uh, just to summary, I think um, uh, we saw how local technologies uh, in QM Cloud uh, with Canvas, drag and drop, uh, auto connections uh, can be used with no programming experience to deploy cloud infrastructure. And I think the uh, one of the uh, unique selling point for QM Cloud use, is you, you get a consistent experience across multiple cloud platforms, AWS, Azure, Google, EK, uh, Kubernetes, um, and then VMware or vSphere if you're using a private cloud. Um, so it, at the end, it reduces the complexity, effort, and the cost for deployment, and it accelerates your, um, your digitization journey, uh, I would say. So that uh, that wraps up um, my my session. Uh, I'll just pause for uh, Q and A for a few more minutes. Uh, but if you want to try uh, app.qmcloud.io, uh, we have a free uh, developer edition version. Uh, you can either scan the barcode or you can go to that uh, URL uh, at the bottom, uh, app.qmcloud.io, and you can register and you can start using today. Uh, for advanced edition, uh, uh, for advanced capabilities, it's a paid version, but for developer, for single user version, it is a free version. So let's let's take. I think we have two more minutes left. Uh, let's see if you have any any questions. So for uh, this is Arvind again. For QM Cloud to connect to my uh, AWS account. And to be able to deploy on AWS, uh, obviously I have to share my credentials, right, with QM Cloud. Yes, yeah. In the SaaS version, yes, you create uh, something called a stack profile, and you provide the access and secrets. But uh, similar to any SaaS infrastructure, uh, we don't have access to the credentials. The credentials are encrypted um, as as they are stored. Um, so we can provide um, the security overview, or we can talk more, Arvind, on that on that specific topic. Uh, but in a multi-tenant infrastructure, your credentials are not shared with anybody, uh, including okay. us. They're encrypted in the in the database for us. But if you're, some companies do want uh, a single tenant version of QM Cloud to be deployed in their data center or in their AWS account, uh, but we can provide uh, we can provide a set of Docker containers which can be very easily deployed on any any virtual machine that that you may have. Okay, so if you don't have any more questions in the interest of time, and especially uh, today for Dasher, I think um, happy Dasher, everybody, and uh, and I'm done. Thank you very much for 
for attending. I'm not sure, Arvind, if you have any um, any ending comments. I'll, I'll uh, um, yeah, to me it was a you. very useful session. I am not a regular user of the cloud, uh, so and I know there are a lot of solution architects, uh, you know, who do it on pen and paper, and then they start writing their languages or DSLs and configuration files in YAML. So, so I thought, you know, this is a, a very useful tool for solution architects because it can it is much more intuitive because as they think and ideate, they can also at the same time start creating that solution. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I think I and, forgot. Uh, I, I they forgot can that. also deploy and test it out and they will get quick feedback. So from that perspective, yeah. I thought it's a really good tool. Yes, yeah, definitely, yeah. I'm sure there are others in the audience who are more regular cloud users, uh, so they may have more more comments or questions. Yeah. Yeah, and I think yeah, feel free to uh, send us any questions at info at qmcloud.io. Uh, you can visit our website and contact us that way too. But uh, but yeah, uh, thank you very much, and Arvind. I think I look forward for for the link uh, for the recording, so we, we can we can also promote that using our LinkedIn and uh, website blog section. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Ramanathan has commented very intuitive. Thanks for the demo. We'll check out. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs>